about Mark Williams as a trail driver. I tell you, tell you my relationship to him, which is not blood relationship, but my father's youngest sister, Lenny Bunch, married Marcus Withers, who was the youngest son of Marcus Withers. They had no children, and they lived out on the Withers farm with their sister Bertha, and Mr. Withers was Mr. Withers were living at the time. And I'd go out there as a kid, spend the night on a pallet in the room. I didn't want to go to the big old bedroom by myself. And I fell in love with Mr. Withers because he would like to entertain me by going to the water well and uh, to draw, had a chain on this water well. I thought that was exciting to go down and let the little bucket turn over and fill up and then pull it up. He let me to it up. And he told me the history of the well that his in-laws had settled that place in 1848 and that was a hand dug well, slave made bricks that cased the, the brick. It was about 36 or 38 feet deep as I well remember it. But it was a wonderful well of water. It would be ice cold when it would come up in the summertime. And uh, J. Frank Dovey would visit uh, Mr. Withers on numerous occasions, uh, getting stories from Mr. Withers and J. Frank Dobie wrote a lot of stories concerning Mr. Withers' trail drives. And uh, uh, Mr. Withers was a great deer hunter and in the house out there, I think they had 32 or 36 heads. I don't, I'm not exactly how many, but they were all over the hallway downstairs, all sizes of heads and uh, uh, and they had tremendous deer hunts down on the Burke Ranch, which uh, adjoined the uh, Doby Ranch, which Mr. Withers and Dr. Blanks later owned the uh, J. Frank Doby's ranch, which was J. Frank Doby's uncle's ranch that they bought down in LaSalle County. And they, they ran cattle on that for many years. And that's a uh, ranch that uh, was it Duval that went to the penitentiary on, I think they, I think he had added 55,000 acres, so it was about 50,000 acres when he went to the penitentiary for failure to pay income tax. But Mr. Withers and Dr. Blanks from Lockhart owned that joint many years ago. And uh, Rhonda, do, do you have a question you want to ask for? I take to tell the story about uh, one of his first trips up the, on his own going up the trail? That's exactly what I was going to ask you to talk about. All right. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories that I recall. And I'm sorry that I can't see to read. This is written up either in my, my uh, trail driver's book, wherever it is right here. And uh, uh, Mr. Withers' name is mentioned in here by most every trail driver, not all of them, but quite a few of them. Mr. Withers' name was mentioned in their story until then. So if you don't have a trail driver's book, you should try to buy one. And it'll tell you some very interesting stories. And they're true. These men didn't just make up a story to tell. They told true stories. They weren't that kind of men. And, uh, but Mr. Withers, when he, he went up as a, a trail hand to start off with, but he later began to, to venture out on his own. And this was, I think, his first venture on his own. He had some cattle of his own. He had some neighbor's cattle. I don't recall how many head he had going up the trail at the time, but there was quite a few head. And uh, so he always rode a good saddle horse. He would take, as a rule, two horses to, to ride going up the trail and, and come back. And he heard about a good horse in, over in Bastrop. So he went over to see this man about the horse and he looked at it and he liked the horse. He said, a good, good saddle horse. The man says he has one peculiarity. He says he, he doesn't like to be tied. In other words, if you got off a horse, you just lay his reins over a hitching post or a tree limb 
and that, that way. But if you tied him, he'd go crazy and run off. And Mr. Weather says, I, he says, I think I can handle that and uh, remember to do that. So anyway, he made his trip to Abilene, Kansas, sold his cattle and got up there. And I, I don't know who all was on the trail with him. Uh, Mr. Green Mills could have been on the trail with him. But uh, he got there, got the cattle sold, and, and they tried to pay him in pa a paper money. I, I think he took some paper money, but you had to discount that when you got home to the banks. But he had $40,000 in gold in the saddlebag on this horse coming home. And they were so weary and tired when they made uh, bed for a night up in Indian Territory, which was Oklahoma at the time. And so Mr. Withers, in his haste to get off the horse and to get something to eat and lie down, he tied the reins of this horse on a limb, low limb, just a low limb to it and all that. And the minute he stepped away, he knew he shouldn't have done it because the horse broke loose from that little limb and took off. <laughs> and he and the other boys, I think there's six or eight men in the group, uh, searched till they couldn't see anymore, tried to call in the horse. The horse couldn't be found. He, so I, get, I doubt if he slept with you that night worrying about the horse. As soon as daylight came, they just struck out looking for the horse some more. They couldn't find the horse. So they decided, well, we might as well go home and uh, go, go to, toward Lockhart and uh, we might run into him somewhere. When he came home, but he, he didn't bring the horse home with him. So he told his wife, his, his first wife, he was married to his first wife then, and he said, told her his, his disappointment, the disaster he had, he says, I don't think I'll ever get out of debt. But this is it's just, well, people won't have faith in me, the Lord delivered cattle. And so after a few days at home, his mail came and a penny postcard showed up, and it was from this man at Bastrop. He said, Mr. Withers, your horse came home, come claim your horse. Well, he couldn't wait to get to Bastrop. So he got to Bastrop, he saw the horse in the pasture, and the man says, well, go claim your horse, he's in the pasture. And so he did, he went and got the horse and brought him up to the lot. And so he asked the man, he says, was the saddle on him? He said, yes. Were the saddlebags on him? He said, yes. Miss Withers got so excited, and he opened up the saddlebag, and stuck his hand down in there, and felt that gold on both sides of the saddlebag. And he was just thrilled to death. And so he came on home and brought the horse with him, the saddlebags and all the gold. And his wife rejoiced when he came home. And I don't whether he told this, it says the moral, moral of this story is uh, these, the sense of a horse, he knew how to find his way home from that distance, the sense of a horse, and he says the honesty of a man that didn't disturb the gold that was in the saddlebags. And that was always one of my favorite stories about Mr. Williams. And, and, uh, and, a child, I can still see him at the water well, showing me how to draw up water from, from that well. And uh, Mr. Green Mills, who was one of Mr. Withers' his foreman on the trail drives, and he married a heart girl. It's a heart ranch was right across the, the road out there from their ranch. And, uh, I remember Mr. Green Mills, and as a kid, when I started to school, I lived down San Antonio Street, and uh, I walked to school, and I go by Mr. Green Mills' house, which was right across the street from my house, where Mr. Jim laid off that property and built two rent houses where Mr. Green Mills lived. And uh, Mr. Mr. Green Mills was, uh, and when he retired, he was a justice of the peace here, 
and uh, Bertha with us, who was smart with his youngest daughter by his second wife, told me that she'd look out quite often, about once a month, she'd see Mr. Mr. Mills walking toward the house. You could see down the road. See, she says, "Oh, she said that." She told Papa they come to Greenville to spend the after the have lunch with us and spend the afternoon with you. And she says, "And I'll have to drive you to town." <laughs> but she she did did resent that, but she laughed about it because she was very fond of Mr. and Miss Greenville's. I would like you to uh, expand upon the story about. Mark Withers working with Buffalo and opening up the northern meat market or uh, rather on the east coast for, for Lockhart and also a little bit about Forrest, his best horse. Well, honey, I, I can't, I haven't, I'm not able to read that story. I, I know I can tell it, parts of it, and I'll, I'll be telling it right. Uh, Armour and Swift meat packers in Chicago was anxious to get that Chicago market in hand and they thought uh, uh, bringing buffalo for excitement let people see what buffaloes look like and the best thing. So they contacted Mark with us to capture these buffalo and uh, he and I think that he had two Spaniards on there and uh, probably two other men but they roped the buffalo by rope them by their legs and, and would drag them and put them in the boxcar. But Mr. Withers told them that a regular boxcar would not hold those buffalo. And uh, the railroad company was going to ship the buffalo free for advertisement. And he and the railroad company assured Mr. Withers their, their boxcars were smart, were strong enough to hold the buffalo. Well, he. He, he captured, I think it was 12 buffalo, and put them in this rail cart, and then he had no more got them in there, and they kicked that sides off, and they were free and, and long. So some of those buffalo weighed as much as 2,000 pounds. And uh, so they, the railroad company then reinforced the box cars, and they put that out on the siding, and they went, Mr. Withers and these men captured these buffalo and rope them by their hoofs and drag them up into the boxcar and they were secured and they took them then to Abilene, Kansas and then for exposition there and then on up I think to Chicago and that's what opened up uh, the meat packing business in Chicago. Does that answer your question pretty yeah, much? Yes, sir, it certainly does. And uh, wasn't there a, a favorite horse Mark Weathers had? Yes, he, he had, had this horse for, I think the horse lived to be 30, 35, 36 years old. It was Forrest. And Forrest was a very gentle horse. In fact, he was formed out to different places, people here in town. And uh, in fact, my daddy worked at the laundry picking up laundry and delivery. And he had a horse, and, and Bertha, Bertha claimed that horse. Of course, it belonged to Mr. Withers. But, and uh, my daddy used him several years here in, around town. And he was a very gentle and loving horse. And when he died, Mr. Withers says, Bertha, please get the men out there, to get a Fresno, and dig a grave and bury, bury Forrest. They loved, he, loved, he loved his horses, and he treated them kindly like he did the men that worked with him. And uh, I'll tell you, sidetrack about Holland Page's horse. When he was courting Nettie Withers, who was Mr. Withers' oldest daughter by his second wife, who I dearly loved. I loved Bette Nelly. And everybody did that knew her. And uh, she, uh, Holland Page was courting her. And Holland Page lived south of town, off on the park road. The Page farm was across from the Maiden House, the two 
two-story brick house on Park Road out there, probably to AD maybe. And just past that piece on across the highway was was uh, the page farm. But he'd go out and coordinate at the house, and he'd get his buggy and horse, and he'd tell his horse whatever his horse's name was, says, let's go home. And, he, and he'd have a winter time, when he cold, he'd have a lap robe and throw over his shoulder, but if you knew how it paid six foot two men, how he curled up on a buggy seat is beyond me. That's the first thing I couldn't understand, and I told him when he told me the story. But he called his horses by name, he says, let's go home. And he'd come right on from the barge of Blue for where this place on board to get on the, this 142, come into town, and when he got down to a little corner drug store there, on Main Street, he turned, the horse would turn right, he didn't tell him to turn right, he says he, the horse's next stop was at the gate to, to the Withers Farm. And I thought how smart horses were, of course, I didn't grow up around horses riding and stuff, but I, I think about the wisdom that a horse has. And uh, that I like that story about Mr. Page, especially, see, I'd love to see him curled up on a buggy seat too as small as a buggy seat is. So he was asleep then on the ride he home? Slept, he slept, he said he'd put that lap robe over his head in a cold night and sleep going home and he'd wake up when his horse would stop at the gate to get into their place. Right. So the wisdom of horses and something. Didn't Forrest get stolen one time and, no, and Mr. Was, Livengood found him and no, said come get him? No, uh, there was another horse, I don't remember this is horse's name, but I said, Mr. Withers always had a, uh, a good horse. If I'm not mistaken, this was a white horse. And uh, I don't know they called him Billy, but he, had, he just had a name. And uh, everybody liked that horse. And uh, he was stolen from Mr. Withers, Withers' place. And Mr. Withers quite upset about it. Finally, someone told him, Mr. Withers, that he says, I've seen your horse up around Creedmoor. He's on a rope, and it says he's staked out up there. And Mr. Willis says, well, I'm, I'm going to get the sheriff, and we're going up there to see about my horse. Well, before he could do that, there was a man that had a gin down as you crossed the railroad tracks that were gin and cotton. And he called Mr. Willis and says, Mr. Willis, I've got your horse that's been stolen from you. Said he was running down Pecos Street with a rope around his neck and says, I've got him tied. And for you to come get him, he says, Don't tie him. Said, Just cut the rope off his nose and had him on the spot and said, On his rump and said, Go home. And said, Before Mr. Wiggins could hang up the receiver, he would knife about that. He said that horse was driving, running into the lock there. And, uh, he was delighted to get that horse without having to take the sheriff and go get him if, if he would still been there at Creedmoor. But he, uh, I, I have some pictures of horse breeders in, in Kentucky that I've got one o'clock in the yard later that was sent to Mr. Withers trying to sell him fine horses because he always wanted a good saddle horse and, and he'd, he'd buy the best that he could afford at that time. Mm -hmm. the, this, this table in that ice box there came from Mark with his home and it belonged to his, with his first wife. And uh, he bought that up in St. Louis and had it shipped, I think, to Texas. And it only held about a 20 pound block of ice. So you, and you didn't get a little ice house here. They cut ice and, and uh, in the wintertime up north, and send uh, a rail car to, to Texas or wherever it's coming up, Lockhart, I guess they got, and that had hay or in there, and well, it was, the ice was so dirty when he got here, to, and then time you cut a 20 pound block of ice in town and take it out there, it'd be melting the time he got it out there. And it, it, I don't know if it's so much service as, a, as an ice box, but this little table, I'm very proud to give to D. Llewellyn because there was a marble top table that came out of that house that I, that her grandmother took 
home with her many years ago, but she must have forgotten this tape when she did, didn't know it belonged to her, but it hurt her, her mother. But uh, I've always loved the Withers family and thought so much of Mr. Mark Withers and you know, his family. They were wonderful, wonderful people to me. Were you on the committee yes. that wrote this book to help save that house and make it a museum? Mm -hmm. I was uh, a board member, they called it. I was treasurer. And uh, we, we were, our timing was wrong on, on this. It was in the 80s, the early part of the 80s. And uh, Dr. Ann Fierce Crawford put this book together for us. And she, and I took her to Alvin Page's house twice. And, and she, he told her and, uh, about what he thought should be in here. And she went to places like H-E-B, but they had quit giving to organizations like this. And uh, it just, it, I, I have to get uh, the uh, plans, the restoration plans for this house. Uh, I went to O'Neill Ford office, and I went to the right person, and O'Neill Ford was, uh, had a big restoration firm in San Antonio, and uh, he was in love with Elizabeth Ross. He, did, he designed and built Abner Ross's home on Trinity Street, and, and he just knew he was going to marry Elizabeth Ross, and that was the love of his life. Well, when I went to his office over there in San Antonio to see about doing restoration of this house, he says, I'll do it for free to the Mark Willis Museum because I loved Elizabeth Ross from Lockhart and I didn't get to bury her. <laughs> and uh, he did. And he did beautiful plans. <laughs> Mark Withers is one of the most famous truck drivers from my part. But there were others, weren't there, a little earlier? Yes. Uh, probably the first trail driver to go out of Caldwell County from Lockhart was Colonel J.J. Myers, John Jacob Myers. He was born in 1819 in Missouri. And as a young man, he joined up with uh, Charles uh, Fremont and went out to California, uh, that was John C., John Charles Fremont, went out on at least one or maybe more of his expeditions out to the west, and they, did, they discovered routes all the way from the central United States out to the west coast. This was long before there were the pioneers going out to the Oregon Trail and all of these things had no way of knowing how to get across the Rocky Mountains. Well, Colonel J.J. Myers was one of those men that helped blaze trails through the mountains. He and Kit Carson were both very good friends, and they were both with Fremont's expeditions. And they were out in California when the Mexican War broke out in 1846. And Myers was the sergeant major of the California Battalion under Fremont. They were, he was involved with the Bear Flag Revolt in California, which led to California getting their independence from Mexico. He was... Uh, he was out there during the Mexican War with the California Battalion. When the war ended in 1848, he stayed out there. And then you know what happened in 1849 in California. Gold was discovered, and it became a hot place to be. And everybody in the world that was an adventurer was trying to get there. Myers was already there. He stayed there and did a lot of prospecting fairly successful at it. He decided to go back to Missouri, but he got on a ship in San Francisco. They sailed down 
around the horn of South America, came up to New York City. He got off at New York City and came across to back to Missouri overland. Boy, what a, what a trip that must have been. But he got back to Missouri and it wasn't but a few years he decided to come to Texas and he came to Caldwell County. He bought some land just north of Lockhart and started ranching. And he started raising some cattle. And he did a few cattle trails around before the Civil War, but mostly ranching for himself. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, he joined the Braves 26 Texas Cavalry and rose in the ranks from captain to colonel of the Braves Regiment, fought in throughout Louisiana, and after the war was over, the economy in, in the South, and here in Caldwell County as well, was devastated because of the war. And there wasn't much for people to find to, to get an income. One of the things that they did have, though, that other, other states in the South did not have, and that was Longhorn cattle. During the war years, there were a lot of Longhorn cattle that were roaming loose all over South Texas, and they were propagating as fast as rabbits. And let me tell you, when the guys came home from the war, there was no problem in going out and, and corralling a bunch of wild longhorn cattle. And it soon became apparent that you could get more money for these cattle somewhere else than you could here because they were so plentiful here and they weren't in other places. Myers decided he was going to herd a group of cattle out to the Mormons in Salt Lake City. And he went out there, and he almost got into some serious trouble because of dealing with the Mormons at that time, if you were of some other faith, you were a Gentile, and you were looked upon very suspiciously by the Mormons. And so he made friends with, with Elder Kimball, who was in the hierarchy of the church, and he was able to sell his cattle to, to Elder Kimball, and he got his money, and then of course Kimball to sell the cattle to the rest of the people out there. And he came back, he made several trips like that, and on one of his trips back to Texas, he came, wet, came east, and he was in Junction City, Kansas. And it just so happened he was there at the same time another man was in Junction City with a great idea. This man was Joseph G. McCoy. And some of you who know something about the Chisholm Trail and the Trail Drive era might recognize that name. Joseph McCoy is known as the father of the Trail Drives. He is the man credited with coming up with the idea of bringing the railroads west to Kansas and creating a market and having the Texas cowboys herd the cattle up to the railroads, put them on the rails, and shipping them back up east and to the Midwest, up to Chicago and places like that. He is the one that came up with this idea, and he was in Junction City when Myers was coming back from one of these trail drives and he had heard that there was a Texas cowboy who was in town. He said, I've got to talk to him. And he met Colonel Myers. And McCoy later wrote a book on reminiscing his life story about how he came up with all these ideas. And in his book, he says, I met with the uh, Colonel Myers, and we sat down in an empty vacant lot that had a pile of lumber where they were getting ready to build some building. 
And we sat for several hours, and I discussed with him my idea of what I wanted to do. And he said to Myers, if I build the railroads out here, do you think you could get any of the cowboys and the people in Texas to bring cattle up here to the market, to the railroads, to ship them off to the markets? Myers said, how many do you need? He said, how many can you get? He, could, he said, I can get you millions of cattle. It might have been an exaggeration. <laughs> but over a period of 15, 20 years, there probably were millions of cattle driven to Kansas and other places. But Myers was the man he confided in. Myers said, yes, I'll have you cattle up here in Kansas this spring. And he came back to Texas. He gathered up a herd of cattle. And some of the books that you read on the early trail rides say that Colonel Myers' herd of cattle was the first herd of Texas cattle ever to arrive in Abilene, Kansas. And Abilene was built for one purpose. It was built to have a headquarters for the railroad to come in to put those cattle on the cars and ship them out. And so Myers was right in on the foundation of all of this era of the cattle era that lasted for many years. There were actually, the, the height of it was in the 1870s, but they were herding cattle as late as the 1880s and 1890s to various places. So, although uh, Mr. Withers was probably one of the best known, he and, and uh, Barry Roebuck, E.A. Roebuck, were probably two of the best known trail riders from Caldwell County. Uh, Colonel Myers is probably the most uh, important one of all because he is the one that got this whole era of the cattle drive started. Isn't his home on Civil Oak? Yes. There's a picture of his house that was a few years ago and this is a picture of it today. It's on Civil Oak Street. Some of you probably recognize it. It looks almost the same. And in one, one interesting thing I'd like to say about Colonel Myers, he was on his way back from herding cattle out to Utah again. This was in 1970, well I've got the date here somewhere, 1874. He, would, he came back to, the, to Omaha, Nebraska. And somewhere near Omaha, he got waylaid by a group of them bandits that were going to rob him of his gold that he had just delivered the cattle and of course he was on his way home with a lot of gold and uh, that was not a safe thing to do if you were going by yourself and the outlaws decided to overpower him and they had a cloth or a wad of rags that had been soaked in chloroform and they overpowered him and held the, the rags over his face until he was he blacked out from the chloroform. And it didn't kill him, but he was completely out for a long time. They took the gold, and when he came to, um, somebody took care of him temporarily until they could get word back to Texas to, to Lockhart where his wife was. And, told her the situation and she met them somewhere between here and Omaha and uh, got him and brought him back to Lockhart and in December of 1874 he died of chloroform poisoning in his sister. And so he probably cut his life chart from maybe hurting even more cattle north. <coughs> 